Hi, I'm Keith McCullough. Welcome back. Today I'm with Charles Biederman. He's the founder and chairman of Trim Tabs. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Charles's work. I wanted to just get into the market with him and a variety of issues that I'm sure you care about. So, Charles, thanks for making some time here. Oh, good, good to be with you. Coming all the way uh, over from Sausalito, California, to beautiful Stanford. I'm, yep. I'm hearing you're going to move here, right? Yeah. Well, uh, I want to un under one of the trees after I clear the snow. <laughs> It's perfect. If you're so, let's just kind of get into the the market. Like, what what do you what do you think's going on underneath the hood here from a fund flow perspective? Before fund flows, the most important thing from my point of view is since 2010, companies have bought back more than a trillion dollars of their own shares, greater than the amount of new offerings they sold and insider selling. Huge. So, in other words, there's been over a trillion dollars of float shrink as we track it, mm -hmm. and so. Add to that, you've had the Federal Reserve and other central banks have created trillions of dollars of new money mm -hmm. that have gone into financial assets. So what to me has been obvious has been going on, there's been more money chasing fewer shares. Mm -hmm. I think we call it supply and demand. Yeah. So float shrink, I mean, most people actually don't specifically call it that, but that's what it is. Yeah. So you're basically talking about a smaller pie that people have to basically be forced into. Yes. And and uh, the other part of it, of uh, float shrink, that most people don't realize, uh, or about the market itself, I mean, I say that current price is a function of supply and demand of shares of stock and money, mm -hmm. having nothing to do with earnings, interest rates, or expected future value of cash distributions. It has to do with supply and demand of shares of stock and money right now. Mm -hmm. and so while earnings analysis and stuff is good for differentiating between stocks or picking winners versus losers, for the market as a whole, all there is is supply and demand. So when you so you take flow shrink, the supply piece is pretty straightforward. Now, how about the actual demand, the actual contrarian nature of where markets are versus where? Well, we ha we have various uh, uh, we have something we've generated called a demand index mm. that tracks. So we have what we track supply of new shares yep. and the shrinkage and new offerings and insider activity, and then we also track flows. We track ETF flows, mutual fund flows, margin debt, uh, all kinds of, we have 21 various indicators on uh, relating to money flows mm -hmm. that we track, and that gives us a demand index, which is very bullish right now, and that we have, that index has outperformed the market going back to when we started it in 08. Now, if you look at the, the demand index, or is there one out of the 21 factors that jumps out, or is it the composite of the index? That it's the composite, but one of the keys having to do with, like, uh, leveraged ETF flows are a great contrary indicator, yeah. for obvious reasons. You think? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Individual investors who go on leverage to buy ETFs, when they're on one side, of, you know, it's a terrific contrary indicator. Mm -hmm. Another thing we've discovered as a contrary indicator is large flows in a short period of time into regular ETFs. Mm. That's also a contrary indicator. And these are very effective, uh, have a high correlation to market movements. Mm. And then on the supply side, like you said, it's, it's a composite set of factors, not a specific factor that you're anchoring on. Well, yeah, the, we look at uh, uh, aggregate change in the number of shares in the market. Mm -hmm. We actually have that by ticker and on an, um, by aggregate uh, on a daily basis. We mm -hmm. can tell you how many shares are in the stock market, in the, say the Russell 3000, mm -hmm. uh, every day. You're daily counting supply, basically, on that front. Yes, now, and demand. We count daily supply and demand. So how do you... Like, ever hear of that, supply so, and demand? Yeah, exactly. So, so what, what happens when... So you get a narrative of, a, of an IPO pipe that starts to build. Right. At what point do you think it'll actually, the delta, or the, the rate of change will go to the positive given the amount of issuance? It's well, well, there's actually been a positive issuance of shares so far in March. A positive to offset the degradation yes. of the buybacks? Yes. And that's We've actually seen a very modest increase in the number of shares outstanding from an announced point of view. Yeah. We track announced by, for the short term, we can't see actual historic changes which we can get from Qs and Ks. And right quarterly reports. So is this the first time that this has happened no. in the cycle? It, no, it, it happens uh, uh, once a year or so. But, and okay. sometimes it goes away. Yeah. And sometimes it, it hasn't lasted for very long. We've is seen a month a, long. Is there a seasonality to it or? Not really. Bankers going on vacation? Not, no. no, I think it, it, it's more a function that there was there's, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 
red blood cells of the underwriters are uh, <laughs> engorging. Yeah. And so they're selling, bringing a lot of high-priced IPOs because there's now demand for it. So what do you, like that side of the market, I mean, you, you're clearly supply demand driven on flows, but what, how do you put a behavioral overlay on this or how have you thought about that since you started this firm a long time ago? You know, what are your views on the behavioral side of the flows? Or well, when they, I'm sorry, when they get exuberant, you know, when, when the supply of new shares in, in, for example, going back in history, in 19, end, end of 1999, on my website, I have a, my, uh, what I've re research report saying that the, the five-year-long bull market at the end of 99 had to end sometime in 2000. I think, I thought early 2000, it ended up going all the way to April for the NASDAQ and August for the S&P 500. Mm -hmm. And that I saw between shares unlocking from IPOs in 97, 98, and 99, remember that typically for yeah. those internet, they would sell 10%. Right and then the rest would come out over time. Well, I remember on the desk, I was at First Boston back then, and Frank Quatron was like the overlord of this, and we would literally hedge funds. I know with, Frank very well, it, sorry. But we, that was the time where we would literally, and hedge funds back then, there were less than 1,000 hedge funds that were relevant, and we had literally just a lockup sheet. Yep. And we just front run the lockups. Yep. In other words, just, you know, get, because there was a massive amount of supply. Did the same thing. <laughs> now, you don't have, you don't yeah, have so let just, But let me just finish. I figured between the uh, shares unlocking and the, uh, option conversions for insiders that there would be seventy billion dollars a month of new shares looking to be sold going into two thousand. Huge, and I didn't think yeah. the market could absorb seventy billion, but I was wrong for the first few months. Why? Because margin debt spiked. Yep, and so people who had spent all their money on Cisco and Qualcomm yep. at a hundred or, or JDS Uniphase, picking names from yep. the past, um, that they were borrowing to get in at the top. Yeah, exactly. Well, now today, I mean, a lot of people will pull up this margin debt chart. I mean, it's, it's frightening. But you also have Twitter and Facebook issue. You know, the, the, the stock's not all out there. I mean, yeah, but, I, the, but the one point about margin debt, it's not growing faster than the market yet. Mm. So you're looking at rate of change relative to the market's yep. pace. Actually, pace. margin debt is bullish historically. When margin debt, as long as it doesn't go up a multiple of well, the market it's, it's change. It's interesting you say that because I've overlaid it as well. It's, it looks much more like a coincident indicator. Than it is it does right like now. A, yeah, well, as prices go up. But a guy who's just trying to go, hey, here's an oh my God chart. It just looks like a big chart. So I guess people think that it's some kind of a contrarian. Yeah, no, it, it's not. So you're looking for the rate of change in the market's gains relative yeah. to the ascent of that. It, it, until it gets to where it's a multiple of the market change, it's actually a bullish indicator for the market if margin debt goes up. Nice. Now on the question that I just asked with Twitter, Facebook, oh, do, you see, do you see any analog to the kind of the stock you can't see that's coming down the pipe relative to the 2000s? It's, no, it's nowhere near, the, the, it's a handful of big companies. Yes. It's not like there was a hundred internet startups and they were all going to the moon and everybody was buying them and everybody yep. was, was praying that uh, they would be able to get out in time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one caveat I do have for your viewers at this point in time, we're now March, uh, March 20th, beware of the Ides of April. <laughs> so if you go back in April 2000, I estimate that over 100 billion in NASDAQ stocks were sold early April to pay tax bills. Oh, interesting. So what a five-year bull market trains you yeah. is don't sell until the last minute. Mm -hmm. So if people are holding on to their gains to, and plan on selling it at the last minute to pay their April 15th taxes due, we could see a significant sell-off or a downdraft that week given that we've had a five-year long bull market. Well, that's an interesting you know, call out in and of itself. So thanks, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for giving you all, all of your thoughts as and, usual. And thanks for having me. All right. That's it. If you have any questions, I'm at Keith McCullough. That's my Twitter handle. And this, of course, was Charles Biederman.